Hi there, Reject Nation. I'm Greg Alba. I'm John Humphrey. We are going to do a special little video today. Uh, been asked from our top reward tier patron and good friend David Gandy to do a pitch on how we might remake the classic movie The Godfather and Citizen Kane, combine them into a multi cinematic universe. Oh, yeah. It's been begging to happen for so long. And maybe, you know, leave an inroad to get Scarface in there for the sequel. I'm always saying that these classics need to be redone mm -hmm. because they got to change that word from classics to something else. They are not good. Highly None of these replaceables. Films. Oh, wait. He wants us to do Touch of Evil. Okay. We'll do Touch of Evil. You know, David actually sent us Touch of Evil uh, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. It's Blu-ray copy. And when it came time to play the movie of the other day, it was the first time. You hadn't seen it before, right? Uh, I've seen chunks of it, but this is the first time I've seen the full movie. Yeah. There, it gets, so it was your first time watching it, is what you're saying? I Yeah, I mean, in full. I knew the story. I've seen a lot of it in film school, but this is the first time, like, yeah, watching it in a linear fashion. It's like a movie gotcha. I've been very familiar with over time, but yeah, I haven't actually fully watched. Did you know how it ended? Well, uh, no, not well, not all of it, not all of the context, but I knew some of the elements of how it ended. Yeah, interesting. I just wanted to get that cleared up. Is that the important <laughs> part of this? <laughs> I, I mean, well, and also, I mean, because this is a Hayes Code movie, you can theoretically draw some conclusions about how it's going to end anyway. But. Well, uh, I decided to watch the theatrical cut, the one that most people are familiar with, because we had an option to watch three versions. One was a 1958 version. The other one was the, uh, I think it was the 70s version, which was the first cut, I believe, that Orson Welles sent over to them. Hmm. Because what they did was they ended up reshooting it, uh, a lot of scenes with a different director. So it wasn't the cut that uh, Orson Welles had final approval over that went into the cinemas that became a classic, funny hmm. enough. And then I think in the, it was, the, I'm not sure if I'm getting the decades right, but I believe it was the 90s when. Uh, there was a, a director, an editor, who had all the notes that Orson Welles had of how he thought the movie should be edited with all the footage. And he basically made the Orson Welles cut. And even though there was this whole lawsuit thing that occurred, his daughter said that this was the version Orson Welles wanted. Because there was a time where she was like suing them for not getting her final approval on it. But then when she eventually saw it, she was like, yeah, this is actually what my dad would have wanted, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Yeah. We only watched the theatrical version. So I, I didn't want to get too caught up in the Orson mm -hmm. Welles rendition. I know this is based on a novel. Um, Badge of Evil. Yeah, I haven't read the novel. I've only seen the one movie. And, uh, you know, to tell you guys really quick, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a cool movie. Uh, really easy to pay attention to. Uh, I love the immediacy of it, and the pacing was really neat, too. Well, and it and, has a lot for a classic movie. It has a lot of very modern earmarks, especially in a lot of the shot choices and the lenses and stuff like that. Yeah, the, mod the modern-day cinematography element to it. I, I felt like inspiration that maybe perhaps like De Palma or Tarantino might have taken from oh, sure, this yeah. sort of direction. I feel like I tend to feel that way when I watch a, a Hitchcock film or an Orson Welles movie, mm -hmm. is uh, these certain modern-day earmarks that uh, filmmakers that we love today actually borrow from oh yeah these like really strong angles and moving camera shots and stuff like that there was a lot that re uh, watching this and especially the parts i hadn't seen were surprising me mm -hmm. <laughs> with the the way they were shooting it yeah with that being said i you know like a lot of times with these classic movies you always have to factor in the time in which they came out mm -hmm. and how it probably held up to that standard of then and for me, I, th I felt like when I put myself in the time of when it came out, it was probably as close to perfect as you can get. Uh, when I watch it today, I, it was pretty easy for me to think of some things that if you were to redo this, um, how to perhaps improve upon a few things. I think first off, um, the Miguel Mike Vargas character that was played by Charles Heston, you should keep him white. You should keep should, a white actor. You should get a whiter actor. A whiter actor. I'm th uh, Wyatt Russell, I think, would be a great choice to play Mexican drug enforcement official Miguel Vargas. Yeah, I think you should keep his hair blonde, too. Don't Blue even give eyes. him a mustache. Yeah, just like... I think that's your first bet. Yeah. and But then make um, the Orson Welles character, uh, Quinlan, Captain Quinlan... 
make him Mexican and yeah. just really confuse the audience. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's thick Mexican accent. Let's get a really <laughs> ethnically diverse cast going on, but not pay attention to where we're putting any of those actors. <laughs> I, um, um, for for me, uh, before I go into like you know recasting, because that was actually the le- the last thing I was like really concerned about when I, when I, we were doing this podcast. You know, I, I think like oh the Orson Welles character. You know, uh, I sure John Goodman yeah. might as well throw him in there. <laughs> who's who's the coolest overweight actor right now? <laughs> John Goodman. <laughs> hey, you know, it's good. He's it's a good. he's a great pick. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, get a real Mexican actor to play <laughs> Miguel Vargas. There's there's many to choose from now. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm sure we have some specific choices. The thing with the movie that I, uh, where I think it can improve upon is honestly just uh, what leads into the plot. I, I think this is where people will probably have a disagreement with me on this because I like the immediacy. I like the, the awesome opening shot that the film has. I would probably start it a, a little... I would let Act 1 breathe more and let the car explosion be in your break into Act 2 if we were to redo this. Mm. Because I honestly wasn't hooked into this film until it got to the part. If you guys haven't... This is only going to be for people who've seen Touch of People. But there's the element where the plot really kicks into high gear when Quinlan... Uh, plant some dynamite in in a, in a suspect shoebox, showing that you know he's a crooked cop. He's setting this guy up, mm-hmm. and that's when I was like, okay, I'm in now. Mm-hmm. I'm 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 hooked into this movie. Where as like as, as cool as the shots were and as good as the acting was, I I really wasn't engrossed until that moment finally came into play. So I thought, what would I do? to make everything and all those sequences, those plot points prior to that engrossing is I would really lean into setting up our characters a little bit more. I think it'd be like kind of a cool homage if you're, you know, spending a little bit more time with Mike and Susan Vargas, newlyweds, really getting to know them and spend time with them. Because for me, Janet Lee's character, Susan Vargas, sort of felt like a plot device here Mm -hmm. as a lot of female characters in classic movies often do as they often you know they're damsel in distress characters yeah and something to create tension and stakes for our lead to deal with yeah for yeah. a male lead character yeah. and th- like uh, even though i thought she does a great job in the movie i did feel in terms of a writing perspective and a directing perspective that's what she was mainly utilized for and i would just feel more pulled into I would feel the danger and stakes and more of the mystery element if there was a better setup to the situation, really establishing that border divide between Mexico and the U.S. and how it's just one walk away, right? And like how on this one strip that if you just walk through that border, it's a whole different world, really showing the U.S. and like, oh, it's beautiful here. But on this side of Mexico, right here, the border entrance, this is where really crime centric yeah <laughs> well and there's also too just the general uh, snafu that is a bomb being transported over the border and then blowing up on american soil and so i feel like the, the context parts of that for me it's like you have this really beautiful opening shot that is so immediate and is really well crafted but at the same time i feel like some of the context could be a little more clear because especially nowadays if that particular scenario were to happen it would be a political shitstorm and so i feel like in remaking this in general you would have just so much to work with with the tensions between the u.s and mexico the tensions about the border all that stuff and um yeah i mean i feel like the political element you could theoretically get deeper into for the movie as a whole because this is like a very effective you know noir detective or not detective but you know we're figuring out a mystery the genre is noir yeah Yeah. exactly and so i feel like if yeah definitely if you were going to remake it it's just all the more relevant to dive into those tensions yeah i i think you could do one of those things where because there's a couple uh, that is in that car that explodes. And the thing is, I have zero emotional investment in any of these characters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, until that moment with the shoebox happens mm-hmm. where I'm like, OK, now I'm engrossed. Well, and, and, I, and that's the that's the layer that I think if you set up your characters, re- you could even have Captain Quinlan come in like 30 minutes into the film. At the same point, I, I really feel like you can pretty much do the same movie. Um, in terms of plot points, 
just have a better expanded act one. I think it would be pretty cool before you get to the car explosion where you pay tribute to the uh, the one shot and you kind of ex- make that shot even longer or expand upon it and stuff. And that way you're pulled into, you know who's in that car. Uh, you f- you feel like, oh, shit, that sucks. You know, whatever emotion you're supposed to feel for those people who died. Um, that way you know the you know the players better before the game starts happening. Yeah, and maybe, I mean, you know, and, and a way to kind of smooth that out. Because, yeah, I think it might be interesting to not just... I feel like it would be kind of obvious if you redid Touch of Evil just, just immediately open on that shot. And I feel like bringing it in slightly later would be a nice thing because it gives people something to anticipate. And I think you could make a fun game out of like the first image is somebody turns into frame with that bomb and the Mm -hmm. the clock and everything. And I feel like you could even in a clever visual way, kind of hint and tease at the presence of this person, you know, throughout your opening moments. And then, you know, that shot kicks off. And so we've already got, you know, attention percolating. Yeah. So really it's, it's mainly the act one scenario (laughs) that I would change because this is a 90, it's like a 95 minute film. I think the theatrical cut, Mm -hmm. the, the one that most people have seen, and so I'm, I'm you know, like, I don't know what the expansion cuts are. I think they all start with that one shot and are very immediate mm-hmm. from my understanding. Because I think even in Orson Welles' final cut that he was wanted to make, it was the same shot, but just with no music. It just feels like that was what they, yeah, it just yeah. feels like that was in, always intended to be the opening. It's it's the complete setup of the movie. It's here's yeah. the murder weapon, here is the situation, and all we have removed is who done it. Yeah, and, and it's it, also, uh, what, what was the, uh, the gra- Grassi? Is that the? Oh. Uh, yeah, what? the gra- Grassi gang, or I don't, I don't know. I mean, it was like Uncle, Uncle something, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me find the name here. <laughs> Killing time on Grandy. the pot. Grandy, go. Grandy. Okay. Grandy, Grandy. Yeah, like when there's that's a that's the villainous gang that you're dealing with in the movie, and you could really you could really build that up. That way, you're not just because you're kind of being thrown into so much in the first half of this movie before you have time to let your emotions um, settle in. So, and I think you can improve the Janet Lee character to be more than just plot device or at least have more investment in her that way you you care more <laughs> well just yeah. give her more of her own autonomy because yeah. especially when she gets to the motel there's so much time spent with her basically just doing the same thing over and over which is you know like being on the phone being dismayed by them blasting the music and that is a tense situation but i feel like yeah in a remake you might want to definitely expand on that character and give her more things to to do Make her and Mike, even though they're so far removed from each other for a lot of the plot, feel like some kind of team. Yeah. You know, uh, rather than, yeah, just her being incidental and and completely caught in this car. Con- just complaining yeah, about not yeah, being involved. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I think you could update her. You know, female characters <laughs> have changed a lot over time, and I feel like you could update her a, a good amount. And I do, it's funny because um, I agree about the beginning, and I feel like you could finesse out the ending a lot, uh, a bit as well, because old movies, what I've often noticed is like once you wrap up the plot there's like a few lines and the movie is done oh yeah they just want to conclude the tale (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. and that's an interesting thing to me because i feel like movies have also changed in a sense where we wrap up the plot and then we wrap up the characters whereas older movies to me kind of do it in reverse yeah um so you know i feel like there are certain things you could smooth there and also to um just the cultural aspects um you know you you have Aside from getting better casting on Charlton Heston, I feel like you could do some some interesting things with uh, the Grandy family, perhaps, you know, and um, I don't know, the war on drugs and all this stuff. Like, there, there's so much uh, just sociopolitical context you can draw from. So I, I don't know if I would want to make this like a Sicario kind of toned movie, but I feel like you can also, you know, draw in a lot of those tensions, too. Well, what I was going to say is I think the environment should be felt. Uh, yeah. there's some, there's a lack of, you know, I, I like what we do in modern day cinema in terms of when you feel the world, you feel the city and, mm-hmm. you know, back then you, you didn't really get the opportunity to lend itself to such mood and atmosphere mm-hmm. back then with, with that. You can make Mexico more of a character. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I want this. Uh, that's what I meant up front by having the border really established mm-hmm. beyond just mm-hmm. the political standpoint 
but really showing that these are two different worlds that are segregated by just being able to walk <laughs> past yeah. it. Yeah. And then that day you're in a completely different world because, mm-hmm. you know, for, for the most part, they, they look kind of the, like you can't unless they're saying they're in Mexico, you can't really tell they're in Mexico, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think, too, the, the one thing that did strike me, there is a thrown out there line towards the end of the movie where we solve the mystery and they say or ostensibly they're basically like, yeah, the guy confessed. And, and what that made me think of because there is such a mystery in this movie about who's telling the truth who planted the evidence is the planted evidence complete falsehood or is it just to push the law along we have a lot of problems Mm -hmm. right now with police misconduct um and i feel like uh there's a lot you can to do with that but you also have i think in modern times a discussion about torture and confessions and stuff like that and so when they have that moment where they're like he confessed i guess he really did do it for me for whatever reason that didn't ultimately equate to it a a narrative satisfaction i was sort of like well what happened at the interrogation we didn't see it was he coerced you know what so i feel like you could also dive deeper beyond the police corruption into things like that too with it but i think this movie for its time and the immediacy of it works really well for what you for what you get that is presented on screen. Mm. I think for a, a remake, there are things that you could dive into to make this feel more gritty and feel more real. Um, like if, if there were to remake this, I would less like, you know, film noir talk mm-hmm. and really try to capture what they might talk like back then. You know, I think it would be cool to still keep it in this period but explore that time, kind of like a better version of what Public Enemies was trying to do, <laughs> you know? I see. Yeah. More along the lines of a Bonnie and Clyde than a, than a touch of you. Like, I like Bonnie and Clyde a lot because it takes place in a, in a very specific time period, and yet it still felt very authentic. It still has some of the Hollywood earmark dialogue, but I feel like make it more um, real, but with like... With it, like more of an Aaron Sorkin type of type of dialogue to it, because I feel like Aaron Sorkin's kind of uh, rhythm works well for a film noir type mm-hmm. of uh, type of story, and especially here, because one thing I thought was really cool was when they're all like kind of getting on each other's asses when there's a group of people in this in the in the movie, like with the shoebox scene or like Quinlan's going around, like every everyone's just like all gathered around the same thing. Everyone's talking over each other. And I and I feel like that's rare in these classic movies, but I <laughs> but I would want to play a little bit more into uh the chaos and let the emotional paranoia and the intensity really build over time. It, that you're kind of cutting around to a lot in this movie, and easily the most compelling character was Quinlan. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I would want to enhance uh, the, the the personal conflict that this creates for Miguel Vargas and why he feels because yeah. so, he just seems like I'm just doing the right thing, you know. Like, He's, right. That's all his character is, and, <laughs> and, and, and that is a very classic. And I wonder too if that if what the characters like in the book, because again, this does fall under the Hayes Code, and so if he's going to make it out at the end, he has to pretty much be just an upstanding moral character. And so uh, that's definitely something that, yeah, I would want to see in a, in a remake of this is give him just a little more flesh, a little more life, a little more gray. Yeah. I'd, I'd also, you know, I wouldn't mind it being a little bit more R. Yeah. Uh, if they like have more swear words. I don't think you have to go like f- freaking like gory or violent. Oh, one of the characters uh, runs a brothel. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. And there's like strippers and stuff in mm-hmm. here. That's what I mean. Like really br- instead of like Hollywood black and white flashy classic film noir make it more of a you can still make it stylistic but more authentic in terms of how it was and mm-hmm. not how Hollywood was trying to portray that time yeah well and if it was me too I would I would perhaps I, I loved what you said about you know the people talking over each other and and playing up on those tensions more and one thing I thought is you know Miguel is often outnumbered by people who are you know with Quinlan in his program and stuff like that so I might even go so far as just stylistically to play up the space between people the tension in what people are gonna notice and stuff like that I didn't um, really feel the weight of Miguel um, that was falling on his shoulders mm-hmm. until, you know, of course, plot devices kidnapped him, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, because it's like he, he kind of noted this isn't his situation, but he does realize what a problem it's going to become. So he kind of involves I himself. Mean, early on in the movie, uh, when they do, before the shoebox thing happens, he's like, this is this is America. Mm-hmm. This isn't my territory. Yeah. I don't belong here. He says that like and he seems like he's just, like ready to walk away from the case. Mm-hmm. And then he just gets involved. It does the right thing. And I I think that you you would be better to build 
um, the weight, the the fact that he is essentially the outsider in this situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got these uh, essentially racist American cops <laughs> who are on his ass. At mm-hmm. least Quinlan's racist. <laughs> he's got these guys who are, and like he he know. I want to feel that weight that he's dealing with, and if his if they do go with the wife being kidnapped in that situation, that should just be the thing that pushes him to the edge. Yeah, uh, but he should already be being pushed to the edge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then that could also make his uh, relationship with Schwartz that much you know more impactful because I like their dynamic in the movie. And if you had yeah just more intensity and more grave for Miguel to deal with that can make the Schwartz character very much a relief you know very much the one other character that you're kind of happy to see each time he pops up because he's probably the one character who Miguel has throughout the movie to kind of Mm -hmm. identify with or rely on you know and I would also I really have no complaint with the the way they handle any of Quinlan in the movie because to me he was the best part He's so natural. Yeah. Like, I was sitting here watching this wondering if that was just how Orson Welles was at the time or if these were character <laughs> choices because I was like, you look out of it, man. <laughs> but the one, I, there's this one thing I would, I wish we got more of, and that was with Marlene Dietrich as Tanya. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they, they hinted at it. Like, they had this one scene where, like, oh, there's an air of mystery and history here. Mm-hmm. And then it cuts to later, and you know, hey, read my tarot card. And <laughs> yeah. It's like so sh- briefly lived. <laughs> yeah. And I really f- feel like if they were willing to, because of the place that she, she runs the brothel, mm-hmm. I think. And their history. And their history. But, you know, I, I think they kind of intentionally kept him away from the brothel scenes. Mm-hmm. And I would have, I wouldn't have minded a little bit more expansion on dialogue there. That's what I mean by Aaron Sorkin because he's so heavy with the dialogue. Yeah. But it's always so gripping and so and so uh, rhythmic that I think, th- like literally an R-rated Sorkin script, mm-hmm. l- expanded Act One, uh, more person, expanded Act One would in- instantly lend itself to a more. Uh, an easier to set up scenario of an emotional intensity for Miguel's character and Susan Vargas's character. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, probably a better ending button as opposed to what threads do we need to wrap up? There you go. Say it to the audience. <laughs> you yeah, know, so yeah. Something like that. Uh, in terms of casting, I guess um, for, I, I it, this might sound cliche because there's <laughs> only a couple of really well-known Mexican actors today. Uh, but I, I don't even know if this guy's Mexican, but, I think Pedro Pascal would. I was thinking be, Pedro be, Pascal would yeah. be the perfect choice yeah. if you were to redo this. I was like good. Diego Luna, Benicio del Toro, Pedro Pascal. I'm like, yeah. well, between those three that come to mind, Pedro Pascal is the, is definitely the one for me for that choice. DJ Catrona. DJ Catrona, yeah, <laughs> very, sexiest drug very, enforcement yeah. officer. <laughs> <laughs> like Pedro rides out of like fine line. His work on, on Narcos, and he, you know he's played cops before. You can and, already imagine him with a mustache. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, uh, for the Susan Vargas character, mm. Margot Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> that is actually uh, not a bad cliche pick. Though. <laughs> Allison Pill, maybe I don't know. Who's Allison Pill? Uh, it's going to be a bad reference, but the only one I can specifically is Scott Pilgrim. She's the drummer, but she's played older timey, uh, ingenue types since then. And she's gotten like, she's not, uh, like incredibly young, but she's not also yet in her like middle age. So I feel like, you know, being the younger wife of somebody, she could be pretty appropriate. She's blonde. Yeah. Um, Good point. Marlene Dietrich, Tanya, Hmm. who has like a sexy... Weirdly, the one thing I wasn't thinking about much was the casting. I kind of thought that would just come to my mind. I know. <laughs> um, Weirdly, I don't know why, uh, but for some reason, the first face that popped into my mind was, you know, the woman who played the mom in Annabelle Creation? Um, sure. or no, Ouija Origin of Evil, I'm sorry, the, who runs the girl's home. She's on. She's one of the leads in The Haunting of Hill House. Um, and I, oh, her and, face does not quite come to mind for I, me. I cannot for the life of me remember her name, but in a way, when I think just on the look of that character, on Marlena Dietrich's character, I, I her face came to my mind. I was like, I bet she could do it. You know, and she's okay. a terrific actress, too. So, Well, there you go. Um, Those are the main ones. Yeah, and then cast John Turturro as Schwartz. <laughs> sure, yeah. That there. would be good. <laughs> anyway, that's how, if they were to ever remake Touch of Evil, a film that they probably should never remake. It's, pr- it's probably good enough. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Very relevant to the now, but <laughs> I'm pretty much just like add on an act one. <laughs> you know, That's essentially what my thing comes down to. <laughs> Mostly just remake it, flesh a little couple things out, and then it's good enough. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's already a, good. It's just uh, yeah, it's essentially I'm like, hey, you're essentially making the same movie, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Similar plot points. I think the plot points are great. Mm-hmm. I think the plot po- I like. There's nothing really wrong with the plot points for him. I like how they keep. Sort of out. I like how smart Quinlan is too, mm-hmm. even though he seems like he. Oh, it's probably easy to out with this guy. He's like angry and drunk and da, da, da. So well, I like that you can't. He's he's also more than just this crazy intimidating physique. He's he's got brains. Well, and there is that magical intimidating or not intimidating, but just kind of disheartening note that like, well, he does these bad things, but at least in this case, it appears as though he was right. <laughs> so like, hmm. then you start. To, yeah, it just opens up. You should never plant evidence, but it is an interesting thing to wonder about. Like, well, is he just always right? Does he have that good of a notion for crime? But, <laughs> but yeah, you know. Were they saying he was right? The guy who he planted the dynamite on? Yeah, at the end they say he confessed to the crime. Quinlan was right, you know, and uh, and that was to me. I was like, well, I want to see that confession. You know? <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of ways you can coerce what you want to hear out of people. Oh, was, I wasn't yeah. sure if that meant Quinlan was right or the guy was just so cornered he felt like he just had to well yeah that's why to me it wasn't that bit of information wasn't like a satisfying piece of information because it just gave me questions i had that exact thought (laughs) of like did he say this just to get you to stop doing whatever (laughs) or did did he just decide because he puts up such a convincing uh protest in the room he was framed yeah that he was framed and it makes sense that he'd be framed and (laughs) spend all this time being like quinlan you had 17 sticks of dynamite you know And yeah, he did frame him, but I guess, yeah, the movie at least implies, perhaps, that he was correct in his assumption of this man's guilt. And instead of Quinlan having a game leg, I make it a game dick. Yeah, his dick is, doesn't work. That's yeah. why he's always in the brothel, because it's like, well, if I can't get it, you know, at least I can soak in the musk, you know? <laughs> All right, guys. Well, how would you remake Touch of Evil? Comment below. Do you like our idea? want to hear this <laughs> <laughs> let's get some blood in there let's get some some explosions and shit let's get like a 20 minute prolonged drug trip sequence let's just make this like fear and loathing but with uh you know more crime subscribe click that notification bell david thanks for requesting this man keep up the martial arts we'll talk a lot about it don't ever stretch watch those inner hamstrings it's easy to tear something if you overstretch and um a guy in uh, your age, I think you're what, 105? You've got to be very mindful of that, man. Drink your milk, too. Get those bones strong. Oh, yeah. Yeah, really get that calcium. Mm-hmm. Oh, do you remember that Got Milk commercial when... <laughs> Which one? Uh, the guy was wheelbarrowing something and his arms came off. No. It's the most disturbing, <laughs> like, he's just, he's just wheelbarrow, oh, and, then, and then psh, his arms snap off, and they're just holding or, on to the wheelbarrow. And it's whimsical, right? There's yeah, no, it's, no, it's no like, blood or like anything. Yeah. Blood. Yeah. There's, like, kids watching, and they're like, ah! I think I remember this <laughs> vaguely, and yeah, it's about, it's about like, milk helps make bones strong, yeah. right? Yeah. Osteoporosis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to look up some. Oh, those old milk ads, man, they went really far to get us to drink that stuff never worked hate milk see you guys